All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. I'm voice audible. Just give me a thumbs up if it is. Is my voice audible? Okay. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our session. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to spend time studying your word. And even as we talk about discipleship and small groups, we thank you, Lord, that, uh, uh, Lord, even as we study, your Holy Spirit will minister, speak to us, give us ideas, give us strategies uh, to serve you better, oh God. We thank you. We submit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, uh, let me just present the notes. Uh, last class, we we covered in this chapter 24, right? Uh, we looked at a few aspects from chapter 24. We looked at, uh, you know, how to be a good leader, how to effectively minister, uh, right? Uh, yes. Raise church leadership. We talked about leadership, how it is so important to, uh, you know, when as leaders, we are to develop the ability to mobilize people to get everyone to participate uh, get people to involve in leadership and basically raise up other leaders uh, also uh, in chapter 25 we looked at step one training cell members so very importantly we looked at how we develop relationship with members right so in a cell group especially uh, you know we we look at people and we enable them uh, our main goal is to is to take members and make them into leaders right? and how can we do that we need to be able to uh, build good relationships good friendships right and then you'll be able to speak into their lives now we cannot speak into a person's life when we don't have a relationship with them Right. And we looked at the example of Jesus, right? He chose the 12 disciples. He built a relationship with them. The Bible says, you know, when we look at the scriptures in the New Testament, we see that wherever Jesus went, he took them uh, you know, with, with him. And he was friends with them. And they saw his life. They saw the miracles that he did. They saw the way he walked in power and authority, the way he had compassion on people. And, and when they saw that, the disciples opened up their lives to receive from Jesus, right? Uh, they were ready to even come to a point of giving their life for the sake of Jesus, right? So relationship is, is the foundation to bring the best out of people, right? Peter probably saw himself as a fisherman. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to always be. But Jesus had other ideas. And he had other plans. Matthew probably saw himself as one despised as a tax collector, ridiculed, mocked um, by his own by his own people. Uh, but God saw something different, right? So when we build relationships with people, we bring out the best inside of them, right? So remember, we, we have to win their hearts before we can win their hands. And the moment we win their hearts. To getting them to do things with their hands is is a very very simple task remember jesus what did you do he he won the hearts of the disciples and then he said now you go and make disciples that's the only thing he said right? now you go and make disciples and you look at these uh, 11 disciples and later they chose another person another disciple uh, to replace judas but look at his 12 disciples. They took the gospel all across the world. And they didn't have to do it. But because of that relationship they built, so they were willing to use their hands. They were willing to step out and do the work. Right? So let's look at the second point. Step two is to develop ministers out of members. Right? When you've developed that initial leadership, uh, initially you develop that friendship then comes the test to test their willingness to serve you take members you give them opportunities 
right? Uh, you give them challenges, challenge them to think, uh, like think like a leader, challenge them to respond like leaders, challenge them to uh, do things in the you know in uh, in terms of being a leader, right? So you you take them from this place of just being members to a place of becoming leaders. Now during this period, right? That's why the word here says develop them. So it's not a click of a button. It's not a switch like where you switch on and the light comes on and you switch it off. No, um, developing leaders is an ongoing process. Right? And in that process, they will make many, many, they, they will make many, many, uh, you know, wrong decisions. They may falter, they may fail. Um, and they may also be very good at their work, right? They, they may just have that inbuilt quality of leadership. Uh, and so we, when we are raising up ministers to become, uh, you know, when we are raising up members to become ministers, uh, some of the things that we can look for is outward attitudes, right? Of course, we know that God, uh, you know, looks at our heart. But remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what is their outward attitude? Do they spend time with people in the uh, cell groups? Are they, uh, are they just walking in humility? Have they mentored new Christians, right? And then if they've not mentored, like, you know, maybe you could consider, uh, you know, connecting people to them so they can just start, you know, ministering to people. They have to step out um, of their comfort zones. Leaders who have no heart for the lost or for mentor-based discipleship have been given groups which then become stagnant. So very important. As leaders, if we are if we don't have a heart for the lost, if we don't have uh, this attitude of, hey, right now I see this person, I want to see him become a leader. If there's no, if that attitude is not there in the heart, and what happens is this, the cell group becomes stagnant. It stays the same, right? And it could just become a trap. How, how can it become a trap? Because uh, you, you as a leader may just be doing the same things over and over and over again, year after year, but we're not seeing discipleship. We're not seeing raising up of leaders. And that's what we want to see in ministry, right? So it's very important that as leaders, when we look at people, when we look at them, uh, members of our church or the cell group, look at them, develop them to become leaders and ministers, right? So start small, give opportunities and keep a check on them. Keep a check in the sense that you're not like, you know, always behind them, did you do this? But their hard attitudes, how are they serving? Are they serving with in freedom? Are they serving with all their heart? Is their humility? Uh, are they able to, you know, take correction um, and and apply the correction uh, in their lives? All of these aspects matter. Step three in raising members to become leaders or ministers is to make the challenge. Now, over time, you've given them opportunities to minister to people within the cell group. Then you you make the challenge for them Tell them, hey why don't you start your own cell group i see that you have uh you have grown in the things of god i've seen that you're you know you, you've been learning you've been studying you've been uh you know connecting with people well um so why don't you think about starting your own cell group and if they are ready to move and start a cell group feel free to release them Right. And we talked about this. We as 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 a as believers, as children of God, we must never hold back people. But God has called us to release people into their calling. And we may think, hey, this person has served with me for maybe three years or five years. And sometimes it builds such a connect that you know, we don't want to let them go. Want them to be always with us because they are uh, you know they're able to do everything 
know, that's, you know, they're there for you. They're, uh, you know, getting everything done. And so sometimes we feel, hey, if I let him go, then who's going to, you know, handle a lot of things within the cell group? Uh, that is a common thought that can come to our mind. But the main goal is to see him become a leader. Otherwise, he's going to be an eagle stuck in a cage. And that's not what eagles are meant for. Right? So it is very important that as leaders, we must be able to release people into their calling. Share what you've seen in him. Encourage him. Share what, what worked with him. Uh, you know, Share that you worked along with them. Uh, he's a co-laborer. Remember the Apostle Paul? Uh, what does he say? He, he appoints Timothy as the pastor in the church of Ephesus. And he writes to Timothy and he, and he says, Timothy is my fellow worker. He's my fellow brother. He's my co-laborer in Christ. I can only picture how Timothy would have felt. Uh, because Timothy was with Paul since a very, very young age. And Timothy has seen Paul's ministry. He has seen Paul grow. He has seen the way that Paul has uh, you know, just given his life for the ministry. And Paul is writing to the church believers and saying, Timothy is a co-laborer. He has the same heart that I have. Uh, and, and that is such a powerful word. Because what's going to happen is when the members in that church see Timothy, they would have felt, they, it will always be in his mind, in their mind, you know, that, hey, Paul said, that you know they are you know, that timothy is uh, is you know a co-laborer with christ and so they will you know agree to be with timothy they will agree to be under his leadership and it'll be very encouraging step four help them to start their cell now if they have decided okay uh okay you've spoken to them and they decided okay i'm willing to start my own cell group uh, work with them through the process until they can run it on their own, right? So this could be a lot of practical things, right? Uh, number one is to help them to, you know, maybe set up a day and time for the cell group. Two is now, now that they've already been part of a cell group, so they normally know how to handle a cell group, but you just help them, right? Initially uh, work with them, relate to them as a leader, right? Don't look at them as okay somebody who's under you right you look at them as a leader okay now he's starting his own cell group so you talk to them uh, uh as a leader because now they are starting their own cell group right now a good cell leader does not do everything himself and he learns to delegate delegating work and responsibility is very important it is a, is a sign of a good leader now, we may know how to do it ourselves, but we must learn to delegate. Okay, Jesus, what did he do? He chose, he told his 12 disciples, okay, right in the middle, right, uh, of his ministry, everything's going well. He tells his disciples, okay, now you all go, I'm going to send you all two by twos to different places. And when you go, you will cast out demons, you will heal the sick, you will cleanse the lepers. You will do everything that you have seen me do, you will do. What is Jesus doing? He's, he's delegating. He's giving them the authority. He's saying, you go and do it. Don't always be dependent on me. Because there will come a time when I will not be there. I'm going back to my father. So you will have to do it. And he delegates responsibilities. Right? Uh, and that's how even each one of us as believers, as leaders, we must learn to delegate. It could be the smallest things. Right? So, for example, you have cell group. You delegate, you know, okay, one person can choose the songs. Another person comes up with, uh, you know, gets the printout of the lyrics if required or sends the link the, of the song lyrics. Another person uh, is in charge of prayer. Another person is in charge of uh, ministry or the prayer requests that come in. Uh, another person is in charge of, uh, you know, uh, maybe 
this the snacks or anything that needs to be done within the cell group refreshments uh, and and so what's happening is you're delegating responsibilities right a good leader makes the members to stretch themselves right taking them out of their comfort zone to reach higher goals, stretch themselves, right? Uh, as leaders, when we raising up other leaders, you will always see this, not only in ministry, but also in the corporate sector, we see that uh, in the marketplace, your leader, a good leader will stretch you, right? It, it is good because when we come out of our comfort zone, we will reach higher places. A good leader demonstrates and demands commitment. Right? So as a leader, you demonstrate, okay, this is what you, we expect. And then you say, this is what we want to see. If, you're, if you are committed to your ministry, if you're committed to as a leader, this is the commitment that you will have to show, right? And very important, a good leader does not tolerate complacency. He kindles a fire and stirs up people. God does not tolerate lukewarm hearts. Right? Uh, it's very important for a leader to stir up people. We have to. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Timothy, stir up of in, in a passion for your name. Stir up the gifts that are in you. Don't become complacent. Right? Uh, and so as leaders, you know, remember that people are going through different kinds of seasons. Right? There may be some who are weak and weary. They're going through a terrible, dark season in their life. right? And uh, they just feel downcast, weary, tired. Right? All of that is there. But as a leader, we develop the ability to stir them up, to rekindle the fire. Right. So, for example, if there's somebody in the cell group who says, you know what, I've been looking out for a job for the past six months and nothing has happened. I've been doing everything right. Pray, I've been reading God's word, I've been declaring in faith, I've been walking in faith, but I don't see anything. And it is very easy to lose heart. There's nothing wrong in that. Remember, they are people. Right? But as a leader, you kindle the fire, you stir them up. You say, hey, don't worry. We're standing with you. I understand it can be tough. I understand it can be, uh, you know, you can get anxious as to why nothing has happened. But remember, in your waiting, God is working. So let's stir up ourselves. And that's the heart of a leader. A good leader stirs up the other person, gives them a push to get both their feet off the ground. Right? And it's very important to do that. Now, we may get different reactions. So the, the person who you're speaking to may say, but I've, been, but I've prayed for six months you know, for a job. Why is it not happening? What did I do wrong? What did I, where did I go wrong? I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. I've been trusting God's word. I'm doing everything that God has asked me to do. Why is this happening to me? It does. These are questions that will come up. But as a leader, um, of course, we answer those questions. We help them to uh, understand that sometimes, you know, God works in mysterious ways, but we continue to trust in God. Uh, so we encourage them, we build them up, and we help them uh, to, you know, rekindle that fire. It's very easy for a fire to go off. Remember, the devil can come and just... Uh, he can just make us feel weary, downcast, and make us feel like we are... You know, whatever we're praying for, is there's no response, and he may he can do that. But he can just you know, like go uh, pour some water on that little bit of fire and just burn out that fire inside of us. But remember, God's word is living; it is alive. It will. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. When we speak God's word, when we speak to our situations, no matter what it is, we can hold on to the promises of God and say, God, I know that you are with me. Right? So we encourage people. 
Oliver Goldsmith says this, people seldom improve when they have no other model but themselves to copy. Right? If people are, if they don't have somebody that they can look up to, then they can hardly improve. And here's the best thing, as believers, you and I have people around us, men and women of God that we can learn from, but we also have Jesus, the great high priest, a great mediator, uh, whom we can go to, we can learn from his own life. What did Jesus do? In this situation, what did Jesus do? Or what would Jesus do? Lord, I don't have anything at home. I, I'm, I feel my hands are empty. Go back to what Jesus did. Jesus said, cast all your burdens on me. I will care for you. Look at what Jesus did. He took the five loaves of bread, two fish. He said, thank you, Father, and he multiplied it. So we pray on those lines. God, Lord, this is what you have done. And so as believers, we, we raise up leaders. We encourage them. We demonstrate a heart of commitment. We, uh, we help them to stretch themselves. And eventually they become good leaders and you know here's a here's another aspect that we can talk about you know sometimes the other leader can become better than what we are it's okay when they are under us it's okay we keep telling them okay do this do this but what happens when they become a leader and they get better than us we must guard our heart right discipleship the whole point of discipleship is to make the other person better than who we are. That's what it is. Right? Jesus said, go and make disciples. Whatever I did, you will do, and greater things than these. Jesus didn't say, if you can just do how much I did, that's enough. No, he said, greater than these, you will also do. That's the heart of a leader. Right? Right. Any questions, any thoughts? Uh, let me just check if there's any questions on the chat. Um, okay, no questions. Any questions? If any of you have a question or you've posted a question, just uh, stop me because I'm posting the uh, I'm pres presenting the notes, so I won't be able to see the question. Just stop me and ask if you have any questions. All right. Uh, so let's get into the next portion, and uh, we'll look at the leader as a coach right now when you hear the word coach or coaching um the word coaching has many understandings you know many thoughts many things come to our mind we can look at uh, a coach as a leader of a team right football coach or soccer team coach cricket team coach right so we have coaches now what does a coach do or why is a coach needed? So let's look at a few of them. One, why coach people? When a coach, when, when we have a coach, you build a stronger team. The coach by nature knows each person and their abilities. Right? So for example, you, you look at a soccer team. Right. Now the coach knows who can go, who can be forward, right? Who can do what? Okay. So if it's penalty shootouts, it's using this example, right? If it's penalty shootouts. So the coach knows who to send. And the coach also knows who can run faster, who who is built stronger, who is who is tactful in the mind, who can who can plan and execute better he knows who's who the coach knows every probably there are 11 people in the team he knows the abilities of all 11 of them so what the coach does is he uses their strengths and covers the weaknesses so the strengths are used and the team itself becomes a strong team Right? Rather than focusing on what the person cannot do, a good coach will focus on what 
a person can do or their strengths so that the team gets stronger. We coach people to enable people to rise to new levels and new challenges. To rise to new levels, to rise to new challenges. Right? And that's what we want to see. A coach helps, helps people to rise to new levels. Right? We, we can tell you know, a person, now I'm not sure if, uh, uh, if you have watched this movie, uh, uh, I forget the name, it's a Christian movie. Uh, Chase. Uh, facing the giants. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, facing the giants. It's it's a it's a wonderful Christian movie which uh, which talks about a uh, American football uh, and how this team was a college team which which lost all their team uh, you know all tournaments. They've never won for more than a decade. And how this coach was going through his own personal challenges and he was almost going to lose his job and how he sought God and God just, um, you know, strengthened him. And he was he enabled the entire team through godly principles, he used the entire team, used the strengths of the team, his college going students, and he raised up a team that was able to get to the national level and win. At the, at, at the most prestigious of all, uh, you know, of all college university um, uh, tournaments. The same people, the same team that lost years after years, same, they were able to rise up to a new level. We coach people to begin to attract people and attract people who desire to be coached. Right. So there's a difference. There are some of them who want to be coached, some of them who don't want to be coached. So if you want to be coached, when they come as a leader, you're there to teach and to coach them. So what is coaching? What does it really mean? Coaching is the process of equipping people with tools, knowledge, and opportunities they need to develop themselves and become more effective. It is the process of equipping people. How do we equip people? With the tools, knowledge, and opportunities they need to develop themselves and become more effective. That's what coaching is. Sometimes, sometimes, when we are ministering to people, all they need is a little push. All they need is a word of encouragement. Sometimes all they need is a little bit of teaching. Other times there are people in ministry, all they need is an opportunity. They're waiting for that opportunity. They just need that opportunity. Give me one opportunity. And they want, they want that door to be open. Right? So for example, you may have somebody, a young boy or a, or a youth, who is you know praying for an opportunity to lead the worship? There's no opportunities yet. But when the opportunity is given, they can do really well. And, or there are sometimes there are people who like to teach and preach. I remember uh, this this happened quite a few years back. I think it was 2014, it was a year, ten years old back. Uh, you know. I began to, somebody told me about this, you know, David Gusick. He, he, he writes these commentaries, he's done a whole commentary of the entire Bible. And, and I, you know, I just happened to open up uh, Enduring Word, that's what his website is. Uh, so David Gusick is a powerful, uh, he, he's a powerful teacher of God's Word. So he's written the entire commentary of the Bible and it's, uh, uh, he's put in the historical facts, some geographical facts, very, very interesting. Um, and when I got my hands on it, meaning when I went online and began to read, I was so grateful because there was there's so much material uh, that we could learn from that. Right? And it was just a word from somebody, hey, why don't you, you know, uh, since you're teaching, why don't you go to this website, Enduring Word, and I remember this person just told me that, 
And it was a tool that really built, built me. Like I learned so much and continue to learn from that. Right? And it just equipped me so much. All it was, was a tool. Right? And with that tool, I've been able to learn and grow. So coaching, coaches don't develop people. They equip people to develop themselves. You see that? Mentors develop people. They keep teaching them. Okay, do this, do this, do this. But coaches, they equip people to develop themselves. You say, so basically by saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you use this material? Or use this website? Or you give them an opportunity, I say, you have to do it. Right? So for example, your pastor may come up to you and say, next Sunday at the youth meeting, you preach. Right? Now he's not telling you what to preach. He's just saying you preach. So you have to go back, pray, prepare yourself, come up with a sermon, come up with a sermon notes and points to practice the sermon probably, right? come up with good examples. And you have to prepare. You have to do it. Right? You have to spend time with God, and you will have to speak. Right? That's what coaches do. They open those opportunities, and they help you to equip yourselves, to develop yourself. Okay? So, yes, mentor. there's mentoring, and there's coaching. Some of them may overlap, but coaches, they equip people to develop themselves. Say, hey, you can do this. You can do it. You can run the 100 meters. You can run a 400 meters. And we may tell ourselves, hey, I can't run. But the coach will say, you can run. You try it. You never tried it, but you can. If you try it, you can. Some of us, you know, but many people have come and said to me, you know, I can't read the Bible because, uh, you know, when I read, Probably I read one chapter, I'm just tired. But, uh, it's all right, right? So one of the things I always tell young people, especially, is when they're reading the Bible, always imagine it. It's powerful, right? So you, for example, you're, you're, you're reading about Jesus, right? Uh, how he uh, changed water into wine. So you're looking at a, you know, you're reading, you're, you're imagining it looking in your mind's eye, you're making it into a movie. Uh, you're, you're imagining what's happening. Okay, you see a young Jesus, 30 years old. Right? You, you see a feast. Everyone are just you know, enjoying their feast. And you see a young Jesus, he's sitting with some of his friends. It's just a wedding. Nobody knows who's. Jesus hasn't revealed himself as the Messiah. Right? Nobody knows what who he is. They just know him as a carpenter's son. So he's there. Everyone knows his brothers, his sisters. They know his mother as well. He's come for the wedding. And then there's chaos on the back. What's happened? There's no wine. The wine has run out. Now you, you know, you also think about certain things, right? Okay. So the Jewish weddings lasted for about seven days and uh uh, and so the wine was over. So probably it was almost towards the end of the wedding that Jesus and his family have come. Uh, but it's an embarrassing thing when you know that wine is over. It's, it's a bad name to the family. And then you look at, you, you're just picturing the whole thing. So Jesus is there. He says, okay, go fill the water pots. This is his first miracle. He says, go give it. Imagine the worker. So, so what you're doing is you're imagining it. And so when you're reading the Bible, it doesn't become boring. It doesn't become a task of oh, man after read the Bible. No, it becomes interesting. And so these are simple tips that you can give people. Oh, when you look at the Old Testament, look at the people coming out of Egypt or Daniel in the lion's den. Think of Joseph when you're reading those stories, powerful, powerful stories. Picture it in your mind's eye. And then you get interested to read, right? And many of them have, you know, been able to learn. It was a simple thing, a simple 
suggestion given. Many of them have applied it and used it to develop themselves. And so uh, there will be times as cell group leaders and leaders in the church, people will come and say these things, give them the right, uh, you know, what, what would be the wrong thing to say at this time? I can't read the word. People, you know, you'd say, I can't read. And the wrong thing to say would be to cast out that spirit of laziness and all of those things. It's, it's nothing, there's no spirit of laziness there. It's just, it's just that, you know, there's so many distractions. So how do we get them to focus on the word? Give them some suggestions, right? So giving the right suggestion at the right time. Some of the things uh, you and I can do when we are coaching, work one-on-one. -on -one. Take advantage of coachable moments. This is the most powerful thing that we can do. And we see this a lot happening among parents and children. Right? A lot. I do this a lot with my kids. And I always wait for good coachable moment, moments and give it to them. Give them. And so, for example, you know, uh, uh, there was a you know, once one of one of my kids came up to me and said, um, "How can Jonah be in the belly of a fish? How come he didn't get swallowed?" And I knew, okay. So what I'm going to say now is going to be with him for a long time. It's going to go into him because what we say as parents is it's go is very important. So, what what do I say? It's a coachable moment. The, what I say, imagine if I say, no, don't worry, that is the Old Testament. God just protected Jonah. And anyway, Jonah came out, right? So it's all right. I've lost a coachable moment. But he used that moment. And you take advantage of that moment and you say, okay, God, give me the right words to say it now. So I remember just sharing with him. What happens when we disobey God? You know, sometimes we want to do some things on our own. We go away from God. God has a way of bringing us back. And he does miracles. Right? He, he protected. There's a wall of protection around Jonah. But you look at Jonah. He knew he did wrong. He confessed his sins. He asked God to forgive him. And that's when God spared his life. So when we sin also, we, you know, we ask forgiveness. And we have Jesus. We have the cross. And we ask forgiveness. God will forgive us. And that's a coachable moment. And we say, okay, if I sin, I know if I go back to God, ask forgiveness, he will forgive us and he will restore us back. Coachable moment. Right? And these moments, there will be plenty of them coming to you as leaders. Plenty. Right? Uh, so, work one-on-one, -on -one, take advantage of those coachable moments. Right? Sometimes you may not know what to say. You ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, give me the right word. Give me the right thing to say at this time. And the Holy Spirit will uh, minister to them. Guide people to learn for themselves. And let people learn for themselves. Don't See, we are there to give, you know, yeah, to share our experiences, to share up, you know, uh, the things that work, good lessons, and places where we have failed. Uh, we are here to help them. We are here to give them feedback, give them information, give them tools. Uh, but we are not here to spoon feed others, right? especially if you're raising up leaders. They need to learn it for themselves. Right? Jesus didn't say, okay, we'll make teams of two by twos, and then I'll stand at the back, and you all speak. I'll just stand and watch you all. He didn't, he didn't do that. Right? He, he, he let them. He said, go. Go do what you have to do. Go and preach. Go and teach. Right? But I will guide you on how to do this. And for a long time, he guided them. So. As coaches, we guide people to learn for themselves. Because if we keep doing it, it becomes a habit. And then, you know, 
what happens is it's it's just going to remain that way. He'll do it for me. Right? So that's not what it is. It, uh, uh, we must be able to good coaches uh, help people to learn for themselves, orchestrate resources and opportunities. Not only equip people to learn, but intervene with others on their behalf. Meaning, so for example, you uh, you you know help somebody in your cell group to start their own cell group. Maybe you're at church. You say, hey, uh, can I join your cell group? Uh, these are, uh, you know, I'm interested to join a cell group. What you can do is you can also say, hey, we also have another new cell group. It's a wonderful cell group. He's a wonderful leader. And we are looking for people to connect with this cell group. So why don't you connect with this cell group? It's a wonderful place. I can connect you to the leader and, you know, uh, so whatever you do, you're orchestrating opportunities. So then you speak to this life group leader and say, you know, I met a family on Sunday. They are interested to be part of life group. Uh, here's their number. Can you call them, connect with them? What are you doing? You're orchestrating an opportunity. Or I could have ended this by saying, yeah, sure, you can come to my life group. This is my number. Call me before coming. What's up? So we are not. We're not orchestrating an opportunity for the others, right? Or for example, there's something that I have, a resource that I have that has really helped me. You share it with others, right? share it with the other leaders, share it with people who you're uh, ministering to. Right? Now, uh, it could be something as simple as a document or how to prepare a PPT. Very simple thing. So orchestrate all of these resources and opportunities. Open doors for new experiences. I, um, uh, as coaches, we must encourage our people to take risks. And these risks taking should be intelligent ones, and not just random uh, risks, but take good risks. Now, especially if you are in a cell group, it's not going to be much of risk taking. But when you grow into higher levels of leadership, you may have to take risks, especially in making decisions. Right? So you help them to do that as a leader and as a coach. So some of us may feel, hey, I'm not a coach. Why, why am I leading you? Uh, why am I learning about all this? Remember that uh, you know, coaching is an aspect of discipleship, right? So. Uh, so there will become opportunities where sometimes people don't want to be mentored. They just want a suggestion. What should I do? They don't want to be mentored every day. They don't have time for it. What should I do? This is what you can do. Right? You're giving them uh, you know, a one-line suggestion or a one-line answer to their question. Right? Just look at a few coaching strategies before we close. Uh, forge a partnership meaning build trust and understanding so that people want to work with you, um, right? Build trust, build partnership, build understanding. Inspire commitment, right? Uh, get people to be committed. Focus on the goals that matter for them. Right? Tell them, hey, got to be committed to what you're doing because what you're doing is, you know, it, it, it matters in the kingdom of God. And uh, it, the Bible says, be faithful and small and bigger things will come to you. So you're inspiring them to be committed. And it's very easy to lose commitment, especially when, uh, when we don't see growth. Right? And we don't see uh, things changing in our, in our natural life, in our physical life. But you, know, you can encourage them by saying, hey, what you're doing is you're building God's kingdom. You're great as your reward in heaven. Nobody may reward you here. But your reward in heaven is great. Right? Inspire your commitment. Grow your skills. Uh, build new competencies to ensure people know how to do what is required. Right? Uh, so even as you're looking at the spiritual aspect, it's also important to look at the technical or the uh, practical aspects of growing your skills. Right? We talked about right people skills. So as a leader, we need to keep developing our people skills, our counseling skills. These are skills and competencies uh, as leaders we must need to continue to uh, build and grow on. Promote persistence. Again, that persistence means to build stamina and discipline. 
right? as a leader, um, it's very easy sometimes, you know, when we get into this monotonous routine, right? Where we, okay, we have life group, we have, okay, cell group, prayer group, or Bible study group, it's just become uh, a routine. Uh, but it's very important to be persistent, meaning fan under flame, build stamina, build discipline. Sometimes we just don't want to do, don't feel like doing it. Right? You know, I, I would share this as as pastors. Sometimes we don't feel like praying because we're tired, right? It's tired. Don't feel like waking up in the morning, spending uh, time. And we feel very tired sometimes. But tell ourselves we have to pray. We have to spend time in God's presence. Right? It's not about our feeling. We build stamina. We build that discipline. And over time, we're able to, you know, overcome these challenges that we may see. Discipline is built over the years. It's really built over years. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of effort to become disciplined. Right? Uh, it's not. It's not like it's not. Uh, you know, uh, discipline is not important. It's very important. And so we need that discipline. But as we keep doing it in small aspects in our life, we know that we can, you know, just become stronger and be more persistent in the things of God. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not, genius will not, education will not. We have talent. No persistence. I know of many, many, many people who are very talented in terms of singing and music. But they probably gone for classes, and you know, after a couple of classes, they say, "Hey, uh, you know, I don't feel like doing this," or there's no, there's no, uh, you know, determination to learn, or uh, there's no persistence. I know many people. They have a wonderful ear for music. They sing so wonderfully. Talent, but without discipline and stamina, it's not going to help. You know, many people who are very well learned, but they've got to nothing. Why? No, no discipline in life. Um, and, and so it's very important uh, to promote persistence. Be persistent. The well, scriptures teach us about persistence. Persistent widow went on knocking until she got a response. Right? So finally, shape the environment. Build support, remove barriers, open doors for people. Hate the environment. It's not like you're saying, okay, I will look, I will make everything perfect for the person who is going to start their, their life. No, you're, you're just building support. Your there could be barriers that you could be help them remove. Right? These could be simple things, or they could be doors that you can help them open, help them shape their environment and then when you release them into leadership let them handle their own environment let them you're always there to teach and to uh have, to give advice and counsel but let them be able to fight their own battles don't go searching for their battles and fighting it for them and don't force control or manipulate people nobody can force anybody to be someone they don't want to be. Don't force, don't manipulate. Let them do what they have to do. Let, as I said, let them fight their own battle. Let them walk their own walk of faith. But you're always there to encourage and strengthen. If you want to be a good coach, be coachable. Right? So we'll go, we'll stop here. And uh, next class, we'll get into mentoring another Christian. We'll look at uh, different aspects of mentoring. Right. So thank you so much for being here. Have a good weekend and I'll see you on Wednesday for our next session. Thank you. God bless you all.